All right, we're at the top of the hour. Are we good video-wise? And we're good audio-wise? And everybody's smiling? Everybody's happy? Check, check. We even got a, we got a mic for our speaker. That is fabulous. Our presentation now is called Water, Water Everywhere, The Krakens, Kelpies, and Mermaids in Today's Water Sector. So, yeah, please join me in welcoming Mr. Dean Ford. Uh, Dean's 25 over, over, 25 year career has included, um, has involved automation systems, engineering and consulting. He serves as the managing principal engineer at Luminary Automation, Cybersecurity and Engineering LLC. But here's the deal. He develops and leads a dedicated and passionate staff of automation engineers. He is a licensed control systems engineer in 24 states of these United States and participates in many standards committees. And he's a member of a lot of associations, but he is passionate, passionate I say, about informing folks about the issues related to the water system. So with that, Mr. Ford, take it away. Thanks, David. So I, I can't sit down, and I, there's just something in my brain when I talk, I have to walk. So um, real quick, so why the title krakens kelpies mermaids um i try to go with a little keeping with the theme of these conferences um you know krakens down there on the lower right they're uh they're quite a, a mean breed um and if anybody's been to scotland and uh, what scotland water did with the uh with the canals over there over the last 20 years or so there's uh these kelpies are coming out the stainless steel beautiful creatures coming out of the ground um, if you ever get in that area please stop by and then you know the mermaids let's you know we'll say that they're, they're the good so the ugly bad and good good bad and ugly that's as uh, about as creative as I get so uh, today we'll go over a few things um, trying to keep with the theme of, of uh, what Josh and the, the Calvary is about um, so I wanted to kind of educate a little bit first on where does water come from, um, who and what uses water, and what are some of the threats that we're seeing in the water industry, and then go over some questions. So who is this guy? David went through a few of those things. Um, the key parts to focus on, I am not a hacker, I'm not a cyber guy. Um, and in three different separate personality survey study deals the results came back that i challenged people's basic assumptions <laughs> so so there's some things i might say that might not work out today in, in your mind but uh just i'm challenging your assumptions and then i operate on on four really foundational principles um, i don't believe in accidents i don't believe there is such thing as an accident somebody somewhere made a decision that caused an incident uh i focus a tremendous amount on people and people how people work with technology how their brain works with technology the last five to ten years technology has increased to a point where you can analyze how your brain works with that laptop that device uh, the different parts and pieces in your world and really the destruction that we're doing to the human brain because of all this technology I look at cyber as a great unifier. Um, I see it as an opportunity for all these systems that have not been able to get money to label something with cyber so that the money flows freely. Um, you know, that's my world that I live in is I got to get money to get stuff done. And I got to talk to boards and I got to talk to funding sources. And for some reason, when you put cyber on it, nobody wants to talk about it. They just want to give you the money. And then uh, for us in the water industry specifically, cyber is just one of the many, 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 many risks that we have to manage. Um, and it's not one of the higher risks that we have to manage, as we'll get into. Um, so audience participation time, where does water come from? Water cycle. Good answer. <laughs> that was fast. Where, where? What's that? The ground. The ground. Okay, so underground, Probably fair underground. answer. It's stored in the cloud. It's stored in the cloud. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> all right, well, let's go through a few of those, all right? So um, for human consumption, water is, is one of the Earth's most abundant resources, right? But for our consumption as a human, 
we can only use 2.5% of that water. It's only 2.5% of the water on the entire earth that we can actually use. We call that fresh water. Now of that 2.5%, less than a third of it is what we can actually get today. So think of glaciers, which I guess in a few years will be gone. Um, so far underground that we can't access it. Um, there are reports now in California, we have wells going so deep that we're touching water that hasn't seen the light of day in over a million years. Um, who knows what's growing in that? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of other forms and things like that that we've got out there. But just understand, just because you know, we as humans are 98% water, the earth is full of water, there's not that much of it that we can actually use, and it is not an irreplaceable, it's not a uh, uh, a uh, infinite resource, it's a very limited resource. The water cycle, you saw this before, didn't you? So, so real quick, this is a, a, a pretty basic water cycle without human intervention. So, you know, it is a cycle, right? It's, it's somewhat of a closed loop, if you will, as well. Um, this is a uh, courtesy of the USGS. You know, there's a lot of things going on in the cycle, uh, snow melt, you know, you're going through this, this constant piece. The parts to think about are where we see down in the lower left with groundwater infiltration, groundwater flow. You know, uh, we need to get the groundwater back into the ground after we pump it out, right? So there is processes for all of this. Here's probably a more realistic view of it because it adds evaporation and then all the different ways we as humans can screw up water. Um, there are very, very few resources that we use on the earth that we only use one time, and water is one of them, unfortunately. All right, so you flush the toilet. We've only used that water once, and then it goes into the waste system and back into the, the cycle. So you'll see, we were just talking about um, the gentleman here in this area about a lot of reuse efforts that are going on right now. So a lot of different opportunities are coming out for reuse and, and um, you know, the concept of toilet to tap. Uh, I know it sounds a little weird, but most of you, if anybody has a, is getting their source water from a river, you're already drinking the city's upstream wastewater. So. You know, it's not that big of a deal to, to think of it that way. <clears throat> so where are some supply sides? Underground, we've got aquifers and wells. Um, I encourage you if, you, if you're on any kind of a well system, if your water supply is coming from any kind of a well, um, check out where your aquifer is. Your aquifer might be being fed three states away. And so it doesn't really matter what your groundwater is doing or what you're polluting, what the people in your area are polluting. It matters what three states over are polluting. So those are some things to think about. Me, I live in Maryland. Our groundwater comes through Pennsylvania. So when fracking turns into a thing, we're very concerned in Maryland because there is no possible way that fracking can't contaminate the water supply because you're drilling through the middle of it. Well, all of our water is coming through there. So pollution is a big deal. Surface water, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, rainwater, stormwater, and then we talked about reuse. So believe it or not, we actually treat, when we send wastewater out, it's far more cleaner than we get it, and most of it's drinkable. It meets all the minimum requirements to make it drinkable. Um, so it's a public issue that you don't feel like you should be drinking wastewater. Well, I think uh, some states are gonna have to start getting over that. So where do we differ from electricity? Um, we had a lot of discussion about the electrical grid. Um, so. Everybody thought 2,000 public utility electrical systems were, were a lot. In the U.S. today, there are over 151,000 public water systems. 151,000 public water systems. That is only serving 80% of the population. So where is that other 20% coming from? Folks like me that have a single well out in their yard that's serving me. There's 16,000 wastewater systems serving about 75%. Guess where the other 25%? It's a septic system. Of that 25% of the septic systems out there, the overwhelming majority of those are failed or failing and dumping dirty water back down into that 
cycle that we saw before, right? The other interesting thing is water systems are local. There's not a massive grid. So if my power plant goes down in my local next to my house, the grid still stays up, right? Well, that doesn't work that way in your water system. If your water plant goes down, um, it generally you're going to have to back feed from another water plant. But if your entire water system goes down, you're done. We don't have a lot of cross connects between utilities. There are some that do that, but very few. So small failures can lead to a very specific and local outage. Um, and but, you know, electric, we get to dump the electrons after it goes through the light bulb, they go back into the ground, right through the grounding systems. We don't get to do that with water. We have to, we have to treat that water. And uh, the, oh, she's not here. She talked about the, the cup of tea causing the, the big problem. Well, in water, we have something we call the big flush and it happens every year at the Super Bowl at halftime and every water utility across the states goes you can see the spike it's very trend it's it's a massive spike of water usage and then there's a slug that runs through the wastewater system back to the plant it's uh it's quite amazing who uses water we all do. what are some industries that that use it Agriculture, cement. cement, concrete. That's a good one. I didn't think about that one. Healthcare. Data so, I mean the, cloud again. the data centers. That's very good. I got to start adding that in here. Yep. Right. So there's quite a few. Um, you know, to your point, everybody does. You know, residential. Uh, we we call that potable water, right? You want to be able to drink clean water. Uh, commercial buildings, what people, what a lot of folks don't understand is a lot of commercial facilities are cooled with water. There's a water component that's in that heating and ventilate, heating and, and cooling system. Industrial, same, cool and heat, flushing, production, transport. Uh, energy, power generation, we'll show that in a little bit. Uh, public safety, you know, fire hydrants, um, sanitation, healthcare is a big, big user. Food, uh, we talked a lot about the area, kind of the ag side before, but there's the, the, the production side, right? There's all the different parts that go into that. Transportation uses it. Think of your waterways. And then we all use it for recreation as well. We don't want to go out to a burning river um, and try boating on that, right? So we talk about freshwater withdrawals, and this one still surprises me every time I see it, but this is only from 2010. This number hasn't gotten any better. Um, but thermoelectric power, so basically power generation is our biggest user, single user of water. Irrigation comes next, and that's not you watering your grass. That's uh, us making green fields out of desert. And then, um, you know, a lot of different things after that. Public supply kind of is a residential space. So, uh, Again, 2010 data, this stuff doesn't come around very often. They haven't updated one recently. There's, I think there's something from 2015, but the, think of the trends, not the exact numbers. <clears throat> and then there's a, a huge discussion going on right now about the water, energy, food nexus. And so this group of focus f folks got together and they researched 1,455 articles and they just started pulling words together and I, I forgot what that's called, some kind of a social area network or something like that. But what stuck out at me out right away on this was, so water is in the lower left and on the right is water and energy and energy. So you got two giant lines going over there and then over on the left again is water, energy and food. So there's a, a huge connection of those three resources, if you will, um, and they really, none of them can operate without the other. Again, food production um, relies a lot on surface water and groundwater. So of all the, the users, we, we in the U.S. use about 300 and, 330, um, how do they call it, 330 million 330,000 million gallons per day. So we do everything in the water industry in million gallons per day. So it's 300,000. Well, to the rest of us, that's 300 billion, right? So 300 billion gallons a day. Um, and so this works out 
um, to some some very very large numbers. Hospitals was a specific ask. <laughs> I have a client um, in the South that uh, that makes this statement. I'm going to read this. Hospitals are the most critical customers that we serve. Even a few minutes without water is detrimental and presents a major life safety threat. We'll go into that in a little bit. Our hospitals are some of the most significant water users in our system. This particular healthcare system at this utility is their largest customer. I think they've got four hospitals there. And then also each hospital itself is, all, is one of the top 15 users on, in out of that utility. That utility serves 700,000 people, almost 800,000 people, to give you an idea of the amount of water we're talking about. Where does all that water go at a hospital? So this is from uh, Boston, Massachusetts Water Resources Authorities, Boston. Um, so the sanitary number probably makes sense, right? The cooling, HVAC, probably a little shocking. Um, medical processes, the rest of these make a lot of sense. The, the HVAC number continues to stand out, but again, in large building commercial space, that HVAC systems are all based on water. So if you see those in a generation facility or you're driving down the road on a, on a day with a lot of fog or, or it's hot, you'll drive past those cooling towers and they're just spitting off, right? They're evaporating. Well, that evaporation's gotta be made up and they do that obviously continuously. Power generation, you know, fossil fuels don't necessarily generate power directly. They do in, in peak stations, but in base loads, we're creating steam. Steam is made of water. <laughs> Checking my, my science here. So both in, in, in uh, fossil fuel and nuclear power, the heat that we generate is transferred to steam. The steam creates, a, spins a turbine, right? We generate power. Pretty straightforward, right? So the, this is just recently, there was a, a small attack on a dam. Russia attacked a dam in Ukraine, blew the dam up. There's also the, the, the Europe's largest nuclear power plant that re used, relies on that reservoir uh, to cool. So they rapidly started pumping water out of that lake and, and uh, making some ponds and doing some other stuff. So they, they feel like they're in good for, for good for a little while. But that's an example of how these things can cascade into you know your largest nuclear power plant shuts down uh, because of a simple thing as a, a reservoir that it was pulling water out of, right? Hydroelectric, obviously, that's kind of needs water, right? Well, not a big deal, except for your Hoover Dam. I don't know if anybody's seen the picture of that lately. It's frightening how low that level is. Uh, even with all the snow melt and everything, that only increased like 20 feet, I think was the only only amount that it went up. So it's still down at like 1,000 feet or something crazy. So, um, you know, the, these are all big supply sides. Power generation consumption, you know, again, it's just kind of shocking how much water something like that uses. Uh, so 11,000 gallons per, or almost 12,000 gallons of water per megawatt hour. Um, so in 2020, that was 47.5 trillion gallons of water. A lot of that again is, is it, the power generation industry is a lot better at, at reusing, but they are in this cycle of evaporation and you got to replenish that. So, um, you know, this is water that Basically, they boiled off 50, almost 50 trillion gallons of water. They turned it back into vapor and sent it back up in the atmosphere. I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, by state, where is all the, the heavier users of, of water for thermoelectric, basically electric generation? Um, so Texas and Florida are the, are the largest, which is kind of interesting to me, but um, I haven't dig. I didn't dig enough into this. It was just fascinating how the the West isn't as where you would think it would be for uh, for power generation. Residential use. So our potable water, right? The little pipe that comes in. Um, you know, events like uh, Flint, um, events like Oldsmar. But, oh. Um, were not necessarily cyber incidents. Those were, again, decisions made by folks that, that, that should have done, known better. Um, but 
you know, when, when we look at those, you know, we, we look at how much the reason I say we're, we're, we're fighting a lot of problems. There's a trillion dollar crisis in the water industry right now. There's so much buried infrastructure in pipes. I mean, in some cities, we still pull out wooden pipes out of the ground when we're replacing, fixing a leak. Uh, it's a little frightening to think about that, but you know, that pipe hasn't moved around a whole lot in a in hundred years. And so there's a uh, there's a real opportunity to, that those things have to get replaced eventually. So residential use, you've got a lot of different things, you know, uh, sanitary. Again, a lot of this is single time use. I don't think anybody's keeping a bucket of water that they're washing their hands in and then washing the dishes in later, right? So, you know, think think of how you do this when you're camping. <laughs> water gets a little bit more use, um, and and it is a known fact that you don't actually have to flush the toilet every time you use it just oh throw God. just throwing that out there like if like if you go to the bathroom and then your spouse comes in behind you and goes to the bathroom you probably don't need to shut flush the toilet the person after you should just throwing that out there again um some surprising numbers uh on the the amount of usage gallons per day per person um you know the the mid mid uh, what is it Idaho Colorado or no Wyoming Utah really are up there. I want to understand that some more um, on the trends that go on there uh, on why why those folks need so much more water than the rest of us. But there might be a lot of uh, Utah. There might be a lot of people trying to grow grass in the desert. So you know those sorts of things we we as a society need to get smarter about where we're living. And when we live there, we should actually adopt what's already there and not try and bring invasive species like grass in. <clears throat> grass is an invasive species, believe it or not. It's not natural to the U.S. I don't know if anybody knew that. It's, it, it's not a natural occurring thing. So what are some of the threats um, going through different areas? Um, so I'll get to the cyber parts for in, in a little bit, but I, I want to make sure that we're all thinking about this this particular industry in a, in a new light, perhaps. But scarcity is probably the largest threat in turning water into a global political crisis, right? So um, there are entire countries that that you know water is not readily available, right? Um, or they got to carry it in a in a bucket on their head for for miles to get something they can drink. Um, and the droughts that we've got in the, in the Southwest right now, are in, in most areas right now in the U.S. are in drought. Um, I'm in Maryland, we're in a drought. Um, what a lot of things that you'll see in those areas too are the, the um, I, and I should have shown that. Uh, if you wanna look at a very interesting graphic, uh, look at subsidence in California and Virginia. Now you'd think Virginia, they don't have a water problem. Virginia's structure underneath um, the Chesapeake Bay was caused by a large meteorite. I'm sorry for those of you that believe the earth is only 2000 years old, but it's not. Um, there's a, there's a, a, the way that the structure works there is that water doesn't get replenished by the ocean. It's, it's isolated. Well, they've pumped out so much water there that they've dropped, the entire state has dropped a couple of feet. Um, now there's a few wastewater utilities that are working to start regenerating that and pumping back down into that aquifer. Um, but California's got a much larger problem. I mean, we're talking tens of feet that central California has dropped. It's amazing to see it and, and that people haven't realized it. But now, I was it uh, that last big rainstorm that created another lake that hadn't been there in 50 years? I can't remember the name of the lake. Yep. So those are the things that are going to start happening. And, and that's going to become a lot more realistic because not only are we having much more severe weather events, but we've also dropped the elevation of all this land and ground. So there's, you know, water flows downhill. That, that physics law still applies. So those sorts of things are going to start happening a lot more. Um, I don't know what to tell you about that. So again, we only use water once. Um, we're getting better at it. There's cities like Anaheim, California. A lot of the California cities, you'll see a purple pipe running around. 
Well, purple pipe is reused wastewater, and they're using it to irrigate in probably Tucson and Phoenix and a lot of those sorts of cities. Um, so it becomes another another water source for non-potable, non-drinking water. I actually have a bigger concern from a threat standpoint. If somebody wanted to do something bad to our water supply for, in Maryland, all they got to do is drive across a little bridge and knock out most of the city of Baltimore because our largest reservoir has three or four highways rolling over the top and toss a bag of something over that we don't test for. If I don't test for it, I can't find it. And I don't know what kind of wacko stuff is out there right now. And if you throw it in the water supply, I'm not going to find it. I'm not going to filter it out. And again, the aging assets are a bigger concern for us. Um, you know, we just aren't replacing pipe fast enough. There's a lot of societal, political things going on in the water industry. Um, you know, these some of these communities, Jackson Water is an example, they just don't have enough money to maintain the system. Um, I know there's a lot of commentary going on about Jackson Water, but the issue at Jackson Water was it had nothing to do with storms and everything. It was a lack of resources and the inability to hire qualified people because the pay rates were so low and that caused this series of events that occurred over about five year period so that when one pump failed, they lost control of the system. When you lose control of a system, the water pressure drops and creates a vacuum inside the pipes and you suck in water because every pipe leaks. It, it doesn't matter when it went in, your pipes are gonna leak, so it's imperative that we put pressure on the system. So what they found was is that when they got back into that system, they figured out that the, the distribution system was not working the way it was supposed to. I was putting pressure in over here, it should be coming out over here, but it wasn't. What they found was is over the years, valves get turned on, turned off to create spots to make fixes. And if you don't go back and open up those valves in that scenario, then the water now no longer goes this way, it has to go up and around and over. Well, that whole system was doing that. So that was the real cause of that failure in, in Jackson. Regionalization, privatiz I should have put privatization. I, I'm not a, I don't believe in privatization. I do not believe that the free market is gonna fix water. Um, the United Nations has, has, and most folks believe water is a right um, and turn it over to a profit-driven company is not gonna solve that problem. That's the opinion of Dean Ford. I'm happy to debate that anytime. Pollution, has anybody heard of PFAS? That's the water guy, he knows that already. Uh, I forgot what it stands for. It's polyfluoral blah, 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 blah. I call it forever chemicals. So when PFAS gets into you, it never leaves. There's no way for you to get rid of it. Guess what? It's in every water source that we have at different levels. It's like plastic today, microplastics in fish, uh, mercury in fish. Um, it's pollution. They're forever chemicals. We're looking at, at billions of dollars to remove that from your water supply. Well, nature didn't put that stuff in there. DuPont and Mallinckrodt and other companies did. They just settled with DuPont for a couple of billion to help solve this problem. But again, we can't expect a, 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 a water utility that already is struggling to, to do this, to, to produce water, to just simply add filtration to take care of this problem as well. Storm water and sewer overflows, uh, it's the world of our climate change right now, right? We're gonna have a lot more problems with these. Uh, sanitary sewer is not supposed to get in, or water and sanitary sewer is not supposed to get mixed. Storm water and sanitary sewers are not supposed to mix. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on under the ground that we don't know about. <laughs> Uh, things get put in a certain way, it might not be working that way for very long. So sanitary sewers end up overflowing into our waterways and contaminating the waterways. Um, that's, a, that's a big problem. Our people that work at the water facilities today in, in our water utilities, you know, we're suffering from everybody else. Um, we've, we've got the, the gray hairs that are getting to the point where they're ready to go. Um, we don't have good knowledge transfer, so 
somebody that might know where all those valves are that are buried in the streets and roadways all around your town when he retires she retires we don't have that record anymore um and that you know unfortunately the pay is low that used to be a, an industry that had a lot of great pensions um, a lot of great backup retirement systems but as cities continue to struggle financially they could continue to cut those programs as well so staff turnover and staff reduction is a big problem that leads us to funding so at most utilities it costs more money to make water than what it, they're charging you for Well, yeah, because most utilities have a 30% to 50% non-revenue water, meaning that they make 50% more water than they can sell. Again, if I have an aging infrastructure, it's a 100-year-old pipe, it's leaking, i am got to keep pressure on that, so i got to keep pushing water out of that old pipe. So, so yeah, we make it up in volume, yep. So... Again, I, I go back to we have these buried pipes that we've got to get replaced is a is a very critical situation. So unfortunately, um, our political environment's not letting us raise rates fast enough to cover that. So let's get to the cyber stuff. So uh, again, let's go back to um, something around the 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 way that the the water facilities work. Uh, so again, I can I can attack a a a, a local plant and affect whatever that plant feeds. If I'm in a water utility that has multiple plants, generally there's a way that they can pipe around that. Um, so that we're not gonna impact a lot. Now, if I start hitting multiple sites, um, more possibilities to cause failure. If I hit the enterprise level, I'm really just hitting enterprise level stuff like customer billing, things like that. Uh, the water utility is decades behind other industries um, so there's not much happening at the enterprise level that's going to hurt us at the operational level. <laughs> um, back to our cost discussion. So there are some things that are going on um, that are being forced. We talked a little bit about things about uh, in electric where the comp, there's a one piece that was used across or one vendor across multiple sites. Well, that standardization effort is also a giant cost reduction effort. So that's something that we're gonna have to address that, that I hadn't really thought about till, till that was brought up. But, you know, spare parts and keeping things running and I can only, if I only have to train my team on one thing instead of 17 different platforms, I'm gonna take that risk. Um, so standardization is a big component of that. So a unified architecture is gonna potentially open up more challenges that we're gonna have to mitigate. Um, fortunately, I think we've got that problem solved, so we just need to copy that if we can get over our, our problem of not invented here syndrome. But on the operational technology, I think the thing that's keeping us the most safe is the gigantic technical debt that we've got. Um, I'm still working on controllers out in the field that have been there for 30 years, 40 years. Um, these things don't even have letters in them to, to hook up to the internet to an ethernet cable i don't i would i don't even know what the protocol is that i'd use to do it um so we're still pretty protected from that obsolescence however as things continue to move forward the automation industry in and of itself is struggling with finding new talent and those and the talent that we are finding is is not needs to learn some some fundamental <laughs> foundational issues around keeping things secure and that you can't just plug everything into the internet and and things of that nature that are going to potentially create this this problem this tsunami of a problem that we're trying to modernize our facilities and we're making them more less secure as we as we reduce our costs and so there are some challenges that we're going to have to deal with there um there's also a terrible trend going on in our industry right now in the automation industry of migrating to newer platforms to fix security holes. Um, so, you know, I can go take a 30 year old controller and I can copy it and convert the code and put it in a brand new hardware platform that's modern, but I didn't fix the code. 
the code is still 30 years old. And so the way we would do things today is not the way we would do things, right? Not the way it was done before. So one thing about most networks, most utilities, water utilities, is we cover geographic areas of thousands of square miles in one utility. Well, we have to talk to all those sites and we collect data off all those sites and that's done with old radios. Old radios. Yeah. Um, and and you count, you pick, throw somebody throw out a spectrum and I'll tell you a utility that's using it. <laughs> Anywhere from, you know, I got some stuff down on the 100 megahertz and oh, this is great, it flies through trees, you know, no problem. Um, all the way up to 450, 900. Um, I'm desperately trying to get everybody switched over to mobile um, to pass off that, that they, can't, they can't work on these systems anymore anyway, so they're just at risk there, then turn it over to Verizon and letting Verizon handle the cyber component of it. Um, most of the stuff is being fixed at the component level. They're finding Joe Blow's garage. It'll get his oscilloscope out and figure out why the radio doesn't work anymore and replace that transistor. Um, and of course, every radio manufacturer's got a pathway to a new piece of equipment, but it's still got the same problems, right? Uh, and we are not gonna pull fiber out to the middle of some field in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's That cost is too great. We also suffer, suffer terribly from the shiny new object effect. Oh, I have this problem. Let me Google it. Oh, this piece of software and this piece of hardware will solve that problem for me. Let's put it in. I could buy that on my credit card. <laughs> Oh, on those radios? I don't think encryption existed when those radios were built. <laughs> They're old. They are old. Oh yeah, I can go out, I could probably walk out here with a uh, with a omnidirectional antenna and get onto Las Vegas's network. Um, it's scary, but what are you gonna do? You know, you got, uh, we were working with a, a Virginia utility that had 1,500 sites they were pulling data off of. <laughs> well, so so the other thing about the, the water industry that I've learned is they're, they're, they like to bury their head a lot. They like to claim ignorance a lot. So a lot of times when I'm delivering a, an assessment report, I have good news and bad news. You know, good news is we're done with the project. Bad news is, is now you know everything is wrong. You can no longer claim ignorance. And so the liabilities on this stuff, and we talked a little bit about cyber insurance at the at the lunch break. You know, cyber insurance is becoming a real problem right now. We have utilities that aren't able to get that insurance because they can't meet some of the minimum requirements. Like, who's going to insure you when you got this list of vulnerabilities? Well, like, why don't I just write you a check now? <laughs> yeah. Well. True, I, I guess, but you know, regulations without any authority or without any uh, um, ability to, to manage and audit, it's just a regulation. I got, I can go to 500 food, I can go to 500 food companies today that still aren't, still aren't applying the Bioterrorism Act of 2001. What's the SEC got to do with a utility? <laughs> it's not a public. It's not a public company, so I don't know what they. I, 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 I'm going to look up that though. I'm going to talk about that. Right? These are these are city-owned municipal agencies. There's there's billions of dollars of assets right buried underground and in, in these utilities. Um, I'm hopeful. You know, costs are driving standardization, so I'm hopeful we're going to work something out there. But I'm also. Is anybody familiar with the concept of digital twin? So the one thing about operational technology is, is that it's very predictive. I can look at a network and tell you what's going on, right? It's very predictive. 
And I'm hopeful that the digital twins are going to solve several problems for us. One, it's going to give us a training platform, so like a flight simulator, right? Two, it's going to give us the ability to look for trends and find out where are things going, where it should be happening, how should this be working. Um, and so I'm looking for a lot of those things to start work to start falling out, but it does cost money to make that stuff work. And so I'm looking forward to that trend coming soon. So on to our mermaids, um, the good side. Our trends uh, and use, as our population continues to go up, our trends for use are, is going down. So we're getting smarter about how we're using water. We have cities like, uh, I forgot your name already, sorry. Travis is working with cities to reduce that water use. Um, conservation, again, that it's, it's a really funny business because we want you, and in, in California, we mandate you to reduce your water consumption, but that's how I make money. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> I can't replace that revenue. I can't, don't use the product that I'm trying to sell you so I can, yeah, yeah. But I can't do that because the Public, the public Utility Commission is not gonna let me do that, so. Um, and then from a resilient standpoint, so I don't want anybody to walk out of here screaming for the hills. Um, you know, the, the good thing about water is that gravity is our friend. It's a very resilient product. Um, there is not a lot that you're going to do to a water system that can't be recovered from fairly rapidly. Um, production process is pretty simple. We're going to take a bunch of water and we're going to put it in a big vat and we're going to let it sit for a day. And then it's a bunch of stuff is going to settle out. And then we're going to say, yep, and we'll add a little chlorine to it, just enough chlorine so that when it gets to you, the chlorine's gone. That's pretty much the process. There's not a lot to it. There's some little bit of filtration. We want to get the contaminant out, not contaminant, but the, uh, the parts out that, that coagulate the sediments. But that's what I say, we don't do a lot to water. And so when we start putting stuff in water that we can't get out of water without a lot of stuff, that's why desalination hasn't really taken off is that the energy consumption to desalinate water is far too expensive. Now, eventually maybe they'll figure it out. There's some, obviously along the West Coast, there's some plants that are starting to work that out. Um, the distribution process is just as simple. It's gravity. Why do you think that you see big towers of water towers up? There's, these things are all over the place. We keep those full. We keep your pressure on your lines. Now, as we say, we don't, one of the things in the automation industry that we don't do a good job of is we don't do a good job of, of cyber securing our instrumentation. So can, can devices be hacked? Yes. Um, have we planned for that when we designed the system? No. Is that a problem? The other parts, a lot of these things are that, that we have a lot of physical things built into these systems that will prevent things from occurring that when things go really bad, um, overflows, things like that. But when you get a situation like, uh, was it Lewiston, I think the beginning of the year that, that topped a, a dam and, and knocked out a reservoir, um, you know, again, that wasn't a cyber incident. That was a, a dumb programming incident. Um, you know, things things that are connected to processes are supposed to change. When things don't change, there's a problem. <laughs> so that has to be some programming that's in there. And that's where my, a lot of my concern on the newer generations coming in that don't think through, you know, as I always say, any idiot can program for normal. Um, I, don't need, I don't need anybody special training for that. Um, government, I think, is finally starting to recognize the criticality of water. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but you know, for for decades, we we there's a group of us have been talking about cybersecurity and water, and it, it was just uh, earlier in March. I think it was March this year that the EPA came out with a, adding on to the sanitary survey that they were going to start actually measuring utilities on that. The utilities all went crazy and said, no, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. Even the professional societies said problems with it. I don't understand that, sir. So I like the idea of, of getting into this, you know, government is recognizing 
And I just wanted to you know, just mention that in Europe, we are getting, we're getting regulation called this too. And, oh, sorry. Oh, so I'm sorry. I forgot about that. No, it's, okay. it's right. 15 minutes. Left. Oh, great. Perfect. So in Europe, we are getting NIS2, which is a regulation where we're trying to look into supply chain dependencies for being able to deliver critical services. And water is now being part of that umbrella. So mm -hmm. being seed of something that you know you'll be regulated on that right. you weren't regulated on before but what is really interesting is that other companies that depend on water in their supply chain like factories you know they want to know what's going on right? med medical blah 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 they're going to be measured on that and that drives me back to a question you said you know we cannot increase the cost of water but I think we need to get to a point where we understand what is the dependency and how can that drive, you know, the, the, cost, the cost of securing that supply chain. Right. Because right now we're saying, you know, water can cost more than, you know, the it's dependency to be. It's a 2%, what's the UN's 2% of, the, who, I can't well, remember, uh, what it, there's uh, a uh, number. Of whatever, right? Yeah. But but we are not seeing that, you know, bringing that to, you know, the multi-billion dollar manufacturing companies that are yeah. depending on water. They, you know, we need someone to pay for that cost. Yeah. Are you volunteering? <laughs> yeah, I got a little bit. <laughs> take up the take up the pass a hat. Um, that's a great point. And, and so, you know, I look at things like that and I say, well, what's the value of our water that we're supplying you treatment treated water if you had to go out and build your own plant for that you should be paying a little bit of something different right um so uh it's talking about government recognizing that we've had a water ice act for a while um it's been horribly underfunded um and they really just did a relaunch i think um we were one of the first luminaries one of the first water ice act champions um so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. There's a lot of effort going on in the industry, in the water industry and in the automation industry um, with different groups that are really driving out a lot of these things. Um, and I think the regulatory agencies are finally starting to engage. So we had talked about the EPA. Well, the, you know, that got shut down by, I think, Missouri, Arkansas, somebody else, all the, all the, the really progressive states um decided to to step in and shut that down so um you, you had a question yeah um thank you this is a, a really good wide-ranging talk they filled in a lot of blanks for me could you talk <laughs> no really um, each one of these topics could be a you know its own conference absolutely we actually I, have those <laughs> okay. um could you talk about where chip fabrication fits in so i'm I miss thinking semiconductors. Like, yeah, so uh, like Columbus, Ohio has three water plants and Intel announced that they're gonna build another factory there and to supply an, 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 a, like an average chip fab or at least that size uses of a small city. So yeah. Columbus well, is gonna build we just talked about. a fourth one. Yeah. Just, it's like 145 million gallons yeah. just for that right. plant. And, um, and who's paying for that? I, I'm well, so look that up. I, I wanted to ask you because there's the Chips Act. Yeah. Right, and there is there is incentive, there is money to do that, and um, and because there is such a focus, there there isn't an option to build it someplace else. Yeah. So, like in Arizona, TSMC is building their their huge thing, and they're they're really pushing forward, I think at least. But this is what I want to hear from you on recycling their water. They're yeah. like ninety eight percent. So. Yeah. Do you There's see no reason that, not to. Do you see that as an opportunity? Do you, are you optimistic about that? There is there is this. I, there's so many imperatives pushing it forward. Some of the things you talk about, it's not going to be rid of overnight. But there's an opportunity for innovation to kind of lead the way on some of this. Absolutely, and that's where that's why I, I talk about this in such a broad range because this is kind of like the magical electricity where you just flip the switch and it just comes on, right? You turn on the tap and there's water there. But water's got an additional challenge. You normally don't see it. You have no idea that your water supply, how many, who knows where your water is coming from? Well, that's a terrible example. <laughs> Bunch of educated people. <clears throat> um, but those are the things that, that, that the, the public just isn't aware of. And so 
we've got a huge um, public relations problem because our public our users don't even understand how they get their water, right? But you know, something that Columbus could be doing is maybe they double the size of the plant and shut down an old plant. You know, there's just stuff that could be done around that um, that I would be looking at as well. But the reuse, the the concept of reuse has to be something that is looked at and we've just got to get over ourselves on that. I mean, I, nobody wants to do it. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, the other thing about the water industry is I have, I have yet to meet a group of people that are not more focused on making this place run than the, than the maintenance staff and the operators inside of a water utility, both on the operate, you know, it's, the, it's like a personal mission that they've got. And they have done things that are simply amazing with junk. <laughs> um, there are motors out there that are a hundred years old and they're just cranking away. Um, these guys just make stuff work. I can wait till you're done the good okay. slide. So, so anyway, kind of wrapping things up um, on this slide. So cyber is a risk. It's something that we have to be aware of. It's not as big a risk today as it will be in the future. So companies like me, my company and, and others are working really hard to make sure that, that we put systems in and that's what I, the topic on the S bombs was so interesting to me. It was like, I, I'm not going to be able to accept just more data and more problems. It has to come with a tool that's going to monitor itself. And so the systems that we put in today at water utilities are fully automated monitoring. Um, you know, so there's an opportunity for actually the water industry to leapfrog <laughs> most industries because we aren't going to have the staffs, but we can spend money on technology and capitalize it. And then the, the big part that I'm doing right now with a lot of our water utilities is there's a massive convergence opportunity that I see between the, the operational technology, the informational technology, the engineering technology. So in, in a water utility, there's a tremendous amount of engineering done around hydraulic models and just the documentation. Um, and, and then the what I call the security technology, the ST, I've got physical security at all these sites. Most manufacturing facilities, most water utilities, security is its own little box over here but it still uses the same servers, the same wires, the same everything. And I don't understand why those aren't sharing. I, you know, I've got, I'm already doing a lot of work together. So we're working on bringing and collapsing all that stuff together. Um, I no longer am, am the, of the, the proponent of physically separated systems. We have enough technology now and enough monitoring capability that I can load everything onto a couple of servers. Um, and, and monitor that traffic. So I see tremendous opportunities for cost reduction and manpower, um, better utilization of manpower around those systems because I can have, now I can finally get to a point where I only have one Cisco switch guy instead of I have a guy in, in security that knows switches, I have a guy in IT that knows switches, and I have a guy over here in OT that knows switches. Nobody does it full time, nobody's really good at it. <laughs> we all hack into them and we create more vulnerabilities well if i can hire one person that does that all the time i'm going to be in a lot better shape so that's the good side um we'll wrap that up then with any other questions josh um i've been stuck on a point you made that water is incredibly resilient i think for certain things like you know emptying egregious levels of lye into the reservoir can correct fairly soon but I would think, and maybe you can make me sleep better at night, that there are some harder to recover from scenarios. Mm -hmm. So something like um, we saw quite a few large farm irrigation systems online on Shodan with hard-coded passwords. Like if you drain the supply in a, in a scarce area or you overwater, that could be a harder recovery time. But also I was more concerned of pressure monitoring, like could you introduce strain that could do damage, lasting damage to underwater pipes or like so are there any lasting? There, there could be, right? So we've, we've talked a lot about and back to the, the Jackson, Mississippi um, concern. Um, I've, 
I've worked on algorithms where if I can, if I can tighten up the control, I mean, understand we're dealing with some of these pipes are, are 48 inch mains, right? You're not going to control that down to a half a pound. It's just not physically possible. So I can tighten up control, but if I'm, if I'm measuring with a yardstick, I can't control that with a micrometer, <laughs> right? Um, so, so there are concerns about that, but also a lot of these pumps are, are, uh, centrifugal type pumps. So I'm not going to be able to really overcome, like there's, there's a, there's a minimum, there's a maximum that I'm just, the pump's just going to stop running or stop working. Right. Um, and those are the types of, like I said, there's a lot of physical things that these systems are built around now, stressing any kind of an old pipe, you know, and that happens during the big flush in different scenarios that I just, there's just physics that I can't overcome, right? I got a thousand miles of pipe and I got one source of injection. That's why a lot of times we'll work off of gravity where we can take that, that the mains will feed big tanks and the tanks will feed the distribution system. So, um, so yes and, and yes, I mean, there are going to be scenarios like you, it, Unfortunately, a lot of this material, you can log on to any site and really get, you know, these folks don't keep track of where their contractors are storing their data, you know, that sort of stuff down the supply chain of where all this information sitting. So somebody like me could open up a few documents and figure out how they're running something and, and get in and, and work it out and, you know, take care of some stuff. But I, yeah. Okay, we've got time for one brief question. One brief question. Before we wrap it up. So, um, in terms of the resiliency angle for water sector, uh, we've had conversations in the other sectors around how automation could be dialed back in an event of a uh, business continuity event or a disaster <laughs> recovery event. How do you see that in the water sector? Uh, are we, is that a pipe dream or is it possible for these kinds of initiatives that knowledge transfer so the one thing when we design it always amazes me when i walk into a, a water system a water plant I, I walk into these control rooms and there's dials and there's buttons everywhere some of them work um but they always tell me oh you know if if, if we ever lose this here SCADA system we can go back and start running it and like i said well i'll go pull the plug you can show me Nobody wants to do that because the problem is we don't exercise that, right? We don't exercise it, so we don't write it down. We have no idea. There's nobody left at the utility that's ever run, doesn't even know what that switch is for because the label's gone. So, so yeah, and he retired, right. So, so can it be done? Yes. And again, that's where I'm excited about the digital twin concept is because we can start doing that knowledge transfer. You know, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of pipes and pumps and valves. I can figure out how to establish flows. You know, if they if they shut the power off, I'll bring in a generator. It's just, it's not, you know, weather is a bigger risk um, than than somebody attacking my system, and I don't treat that very well. So how the hell am I ever going to spend time on the cyber side of it? But those sorts of things, when I start to solve for tornadoes and hurricanes and other stuff, I automatically solve for cyber. So when I say cyber is a great unifier. I can go get money for cyber, dress it all up, make it look pretty, get a bunch of money, but I'm actually solving a whole bunch of other problems. So I look at, I look at the cyber um, front as a great unifier for us to solve a lot of money problems inside these utilities. Because like I said, I, I'll write some kind of cyber function on it and the board doesn't even want to talk about it. They don't want to know, they just, how much do you need? Don't tell me, I don't want to know. Yeah. Plausible deniability. <laughs> All right. I, listen, Dean, this has been fabulous. Please join me in thanking Dean Ford for this really fascinating discussion.